We have freedom in this country, and that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? And you can, we have freedom of religion and freedom of speech, and that's one of the cool things about being an American. Battery Park, in the heart of downtown New York. And a hymn to America in the last of the summer sunshine. New York is the richest city and the richest country in the world. But just a few miles uptown live some of the poorest communities in America. In the Bronx, three grandchildren try to bring their grandmother up to date with the latest fashions. I like this one better. But two people are missing from this picture. Veronica Momadou recently died of AIDS. It was left to her mother Regina to bring up three granddaughters and a grandson, Garfield, who's HIV positive. Veronica and Regina had wanted to have a say in the treatment Garfield received. But instead, the New York authorities insisted Garfield stay on drugs and medicines, which even the other children could see were making him ill. When he was, when he was drinking the medicine, sometimes at night, it was in the summertime too, at night he would say, Mommy, I'm cold, I'm cold, or he would itch his body all over, nonstop. And every time he said, um, he was cold. My aunt went to the to put the heat on. He put the heat up a lot of times, but he kept saying he was cold. Is this why your family decided to stop the medicine? Yeah, my aunt stopped it because he wasn't feeling comfortable. And he started to get well. But when she went for a checkup, they, they gave him the medicine again without her knowing it. And did he get sick again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know what type of medicine they were given. If I is allergic to sulfur, if they give it to him, that is scratching all over his body, and he caught his appetite, you know, eat, and he started getting skinny and skinnier. Convinced that the medicines were making things worse, not better, they turned to their hospital doctor for advice. He made an unexpected offer. My daughter told me, she said when she went to see the doctor, at that time it was the child's appointment day. So the man said they will be giving her $25 for, for month if they can put the child on experimental basis. She said, I will think about it. And she said, no. Then the doctor told her, he said, you, you, will, be, you will regret it. Regina's daughter took Garfield off all medication. Almost immediately, his health improved. Then there was a knock on the door. They came to take the child. And uh, they came with police. I, I think it was three to four police then. In New York, you don't need a court order to take a child from its parents. The Administration for Children's Services, or ACS, has exceptionally strong legal powers to decide what's best for the city's kids. They're essentially out of control. Uh, I've had many ACS caseworkers tell me, we're ACS, we can do whatever we want, and they usually get away with it. Garfield simply disappeared into the system. One of 23,000 children placed either with foster parents or in children's homes. This Catholic-run home, the Incarnation Children's Centre in Harlem, is where many HIV children end up if their parents or guardians refuse to medicate them. For years, it was the centre of highly controversial and secretive drug trials on orphans and foster children as young as three months old. At the time, it did not occur to me that anything was wrong because we were told by the doctors that these were all 
steps that were going to happen to be expected because they were all HIV positive. Jacqueline Hoja is a pediatric nurse who worked at Incarnation for five years. If they were vomiting, if they lost their ability to walk, if they were having diarrhea, if they were dying, then all of this was because of their HIV infection and to be expected and that we were doing the best we could to save them from that. Jacqueline was completely unaware that she was party to experiments on children. It didn't come as my first thought at all to question the medication and since I had worked with pediatric AIDS for many years and had given the medication, um, I just faithfully gave it as I was told by the doctors. We found documentation listing some of the experiments carried out on HIV children at the home. One was for treating herpes. Another involved giving children double doses of the measles vaccine. And yet others involved whole cocktails of drugs with side effects admitted by the manufacturers including severe stomach pain, muscle wastage, organ failure, and many more. Side effect is a euphemism for, for undesired direct effects. The effects of the anti-HIV drugs are, are quite serious. In fact, in fact, if you look at the uh, inserts that comes with these drugs, you will see virtually all of them will have a black box warning label, which is the highest, most severe warning that these drugs can have and still be uh, prescribable to human beings before they're taken off the market. They're lethal. 3,000 miles west of Manhattan, Dr. David Rasnick is internationally renowned for his work on numerous diseases, including cancer. I'll scroll it up a little so we can see the, the years and everything. And it's AIDS cases, deaths, and... He studied the effects of HIV drugs on patients, particularly children. The young are not completely developed yet. The immune system isn't completely mature until your person's in their teens, typically. We asked for his opinion on some of the incarnation trials. We're talking about serious, serious side effects. Didanosine, all by itself, is, is, is a very dangerous drug. Zidovidine is our fa uh, famous AZT, which has never been shown to be life-saving. It also causes severe anemia. Nevirapine is the drug that also causes that Steven Johnson syndrome, the flaking of the skin, and it's very, very dangerous and debilitating. It's horrible and painful and also lethal. These children are going to be miserable. They're absolutely going to be miserable. They're going to resist taking them after a while. They're going to probably take them when people give it to them. They're going to suffer so much AZT all by itself. They're going to have cramps. They're going to have diarrhea. They're not going to eat. Their, their joints are going to swell up. They're going to roll around on the ground. You can't touch them. And I understand that the Incarnation Center, uh, they sent them to the hospitals, these children, and they cut a hole in their belly and put a feeding tube in their belly and administer the drugs to the children who don't take these drugs. My friend Jody said she never, never, ever let to take a medicine. So they still held her down, forced it down her throat. And I tell her, what would you like this? This boy spent most of his life at incarnation. Age 15, after years on drug tests, he has the physique of a 10-year-old. He didn't want to show his face, but he did want to tell the story of what happened to him in the home. I did not want to take the medications, and I did not want to, uh, you know, do all that stuff. But they insisted? Yeah, if you want to get out of there, you have to do what they say, or else you're not going anywhere. His medical records, which we've obtained, prove that he was enrolled in drug trials while living at Incarnation. If a child refused to take the medicine, a peg tube was inserted directly into the stomach, something he warned his friends about. And I used to tell her every single day, please take your medicine. Don't want a tube in your stomach. And she didn't listen to me. She, that's what she got. And my friend Daniel, he didn't like to take his medicine either. And he got a tube in his stomach. 
Under federal rules, consent for children to take part in drug trials has to be given by their parent or guardian. But the kids at Incarnation have no independent voice. The body that is their legal guardian, the ACS, is the same body that makes the children available for trials. You would not expect too many parents to volunteer their loved children for such experiments. This means that if the researchers want to do the experiment on children, they're going to look for vulnerable children whom they can get. And when you have city government agency accommodating them, that is the biggest betrayal of those children. They don't have anyone but the city agency that is their guardian on paper, but not in human ways. For over 10 years, Vera Shirav has battled almost single-handedly with the New York authorities to come clean over the use of children in drug trials. They tested these very highly experimental drugs, phase one and phase two. Why didn't they provide the children with the current best treatment? That's the question that we have. Why did they expose them to risk and pain when they were helpless? Would they have done those experiments to their own children? I doubt it. When we spoke to the ACS early in our investigation, they told us that no child was selected for trials without a long process of decision-making. I would absolutely reject the idea that they go through a process. Yes, they go through a process, but it is uh, in, in, on paper only. For example, the city department created a panel, uh, an ethics committee, that approved the experiments that were conducted at Incarnation House. There's only one little pesky detail. The panelists all come from hospitals that conduct the trials, so they all are stakeholders in saying that it was perfectly all right. Most of the children in the trials are from New York's poorest districts. Many were born to drug-addicted mothers. Over 98% of children in foster care in the city are black or Latino. But in New York City, where the ACS was given special powers by former Mayor Rudy Giuliani, even professionals realize they are fighting a losing battle. Jacqueline Hoja, the nurse who had once administered the drugs to children at Incarnation, was about to discover just how difficult it really was. She decided to add to her existing family by adopting two young girls she'd grown to love at the home. They were half-sisters, and um, the younger of the two was pretty much immobile, didn't know how to walk, uh, didn't know how to play, didn't speak much, didn't know how to show her emotions or feeling whatsoever. And her sister was the opposite. She was hyperactive, couldn't sit for a minute, couldn't be still for a minute, um, and wouldn't eat. And uh, the younger of the two overate, so it was a complete mess. I gave them all that I could on every level. Um, I gave them the good quality foods, the rest, the best private schooling they could get, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, tutoring, the best psychologists I could find on all levels and I just didn't seem to be making any headway and uh, the only thing that was left was the medication that I was giving them yeah. okay, Doc. <laughs> Jacqueline decided to take the children off the drug regime which incarnation had insisted upon the results were almost instantaneous the older girl began eating properly for the first time she would ask for seconds and thirds, and it started showing on her body. Um, when we swam at a swim club that we go to, she had a swimsuit on, 
uh, about a month or two after I took her off the medication, I just looked at her with those loving mother eyes, just seeing a daughter look beautiful, rounded out, muscular, strong, healthy. It was a wonderful sight. The younger daughter, I would say the main change after I took her off the medication, it felt that her nerves became more and more healthy. And uh, I taught her how to walk, run, jump on the trampoline, play, ride the bicycle, swim. And uh, it was a joy to watch her. I remember the first Christmas when they all got new hats and they sat in the corner, all three of them together next to the Christmas tree in their new hats, surrounded with their presents. And Eileen had this little shy smile, Olivia beaming from ear to ear, and Leah sitting over them. And on Christmas morning, I looked and there was the faintest bread in the horizon. So I turned on the light, they all got up, we opened our presents, you know, our stockings, and we started yelling out the window, Thank you, Santa Claus! And then Mommy came stomping down, uh, stomping down the stairs. How dare you guys, it's only one o'clock in the morning! <laughs> Not long after those Christmas celebrations, there was a visit from the ACS. It was a Saturday morning, and uh, they had come a few times unannounced, so when I saw them at the door, I invited them in, and uh, they said, this is not a happy visit. And at that point, they told me that they were taking their children away, and if I was in shock. I couldn't believe it. We were, it's a home day, they're in their pajamas, and... Um, um, <laughs> the social worker involved in the case was Demetrius Travis. He was on holiday when a temporary caseworker arrived at their door with the ACS. The family did not agree with um, the drugs that were being given to these children who uh, had HIV. And as a result of the parents not agreeing with the, um, the medicinal, I guess, regimen that was being administered to the children, when it was learned that that regimen was not being followed, the children were taken back into foster care. Did that decision upset you? It bothered me, yeah, because I can remember how well off uh, these children seemed to be. And, and, and that just wasn't, that wasn't just my opinion. That was the opinion of this mental health professional who had dealt with these children over a period of, I would say, a year and a half, two years. As a result, Jacqueline was taken to court and convicted of child abuse. Where are they now? I don't know. I'm not allowed to know. Jacqueline's greatest fear is they've been returned to Incarnation Children's Center or a similar home in New York where they might be subjected to experimentation. Well, it is shocking that uh, in New York City, uh, exper experimental drug treatments are being used on uh, children who are in foster care. Even senior politicians in the city have found it okay. impossible to get information about the trials. Bill Perkins is deputy right. majority leader on New York City Council. We do know that several have passed away uh, during the course of these experiments, uh, and we know that there are still some involved. Um, and there's been somewhat of a secrecy about the whole matter. I must say, it has not been easy to uh, get through the bureaucracy as to exactly uh, what this is all about. In a mass grave owned by the Roman Catholic Church close to Manhattan, over a thousand children's bodies, including some who were enrolled in the trials, lie beneath a tarpaulin. Officially, their deaths are recorded only as resulting from natural causes. For months, we tried to get answers from those behind the trials. From Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, where many of the tests were devised. 
from Incarnation Children's Center, from the Catholic Church, and from the ACS, the authority ultimately responsible. None would comment. The drug companies which have supported trials at Incarnation include some of the world's largest. Among them, Britain's own GlaxoSmithKline. They also refuse to be interviewed for this programme, saying only that all trials have stringent standards and are in compliance with local laws and regulations. In Washington, officials at the National Institutes for Health insist that any participation of children in drug trials should be voluntary in every sense. We let parents know that participation is always voluntary, that they can stop participating in a trial at any time. Many parents um, need to have that reinforced, um, that participation is voluntary. We also get the assent of the child when it's appropriate. But what if that child is in the care of New York City authorities, which have volunteered it for trials in the first place? New York law hasn't made clear where the boundaries are between the parent's right to provide and control the treatment for the child and ACS's right. And as a result, the parent loses out and the child loses out because ACS simply says, we're going to make all the decisions. In 2002, the trials at Incarnation were suddenly halted. Attempts to uncover why, exactly, meet either with silence... ...or a call to the NYPD to have us removed. We have every idea. We have every supposedly, idea. Supposedly, they're stating that... Um... During the making of this programme, the Food and Drugs Administration announced an investigation into the trials, which we have discovered are continuing at at least six other locations in New York City. Meanwhile, Regina Musa from the Bronx is now in contact with her grandson, Garfield. She's won a court order granting her visitation rights. We have to go straight for well, this area. Is what? Is brown soup there? This is her grandson's new foster home in the Bronx. The boy was hungry and Regina had brought food. Although the house was in poor condition, it was better than his previous one, where the foster mother had allegedly beaten him. Garfield's new foster mother receives $6,000 every month for him and three others. What makes her a better guardian in the eyes of the authorities is that she gives the medicine demanded by the ACS, and Regina refuses. I want to get him back. I want to get him back. Because I don't want my child to remain in experimental basis. Not my own grandson, because we love him. Jacqueline Hoja has had no news of the two little girls she was adopting since that day when the ACS arrived on her doorstep. We weren't given any rights whatsoever. I even wrote a letter to the social worker appealing to her humanity to just let us know something. But I don't know anything. Did you ever say to the nurses or the doctors that you felt the medicine was wrong? I do I try. I just try to be me. I don't bother anybody. People do things for, like I said, a reason. Little good bad. You have to forgive them for what they do.